Hi guys, we're here for our June 15th Bible in a Year challenge reading. That is going to come from 1 Chronicles 10 through 12, Job 16, and 1 Corinthians 6. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 10, sorry, 1 Chronicles chapter 10. The death of King Saul. Now the Philistines attacked Israel, forcing the Israelites to flee. Many were slaughtered on the slopes of Mount Gilboa. The Philistines closed it on Saul and his sons, and they killed three of his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Melchishua. The fighting grew very fierce around Saul, and the Philistine archers caught up with him and wounded him severely. Saul groaned to his armor bearer, Take your sword and run me through before these pagan Philistines come and humiliate me. But his armor bearer was afraid and would not do it, so Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When his armor bearer realized that Saul was dead, he fell on his own sword and died. So Saul and his three sons died there together, bringing his dynasty to an end. When the Israelites in the Jezreel Valley saw that their army had been routed and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their towns and fled. So the Philistines moved in and occupied their towns. The next day, when the Philistines went out to strip the dead, they found the bodies of Saul and his sons on Mount Gilboa. So they stripped off Saul's armor and cut off his head. Then they proclaimed the news of Saul's death before their idols and to the people throughout the land of Philistia. They placed his armor in the temple of their gods, and they fastened his head to the wall in the temple of Dagon. When the people of Gabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, their warriors went out and brought the bodies of Saul and his three sons back to Jabesh. Then they buried their remains beneath the oak tree at Jabesh, and they fasted for seven days. So Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He failed to obey the Lord's command, and he even consulted a medium instead of asking the Lord for guidance. So the Lord killed him and turned his kingdom over to David, son of Jesse. Chapter 11, David becomes king of all Israel. Then all Israel went to David at Hebron and told him, We are all members of your family. For a long time, even while Saul was our king, you were the one who really led Israel. And the Lord was your God has told you, You will be the shepherd of my people Israel. You will be their leader. So there at Hebron, David made a covenant with the leaders of Israel before the Lord. They anointed him king of Israel, just as the Lord had promised through Samuel. David captures Jerusalem. Then David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, or Jebus, as it used to be called, where the Jebusites, original inhabitants of the land, lived. The people of Jebus said to David, you will never get in here. But David captured the fortress of Zion, now called the city of David. David had said to his troops, Whoever leads the attack against the Jebusites will become the commander of my armies. And Job, the son of David's sister, Zeruiah, led the attack, so he became the commander of David's armies. David made the fortress his home, and that is why it is called the city of David. He extended the city from the Millo to the surrounding area while Job rebuilt the rest of Jerusalem. And David became more and more powerful because the Lord Almighty was, was with him. David's mightiest men. These are the leaders of David's mighty men. Together with all Israel, they determined to make David their king, just as the Lord had promised concerning Israel. Here is a record of David's mightiest men. The first was Jashabim, the Hakmonite, who was commander of the three, the three greatest warriors among David's men. He once used his spear to kill 300 enemy warriors in a single battle. Next in rank among the three was Eliezer, son of Dodai, a descendant of Ahoa. He was with David in the battle against the Philistines at Pass Damim. The battle took place in a field full of barley, and the Israelite army fled. But Eliezer and David held their ground in the middle of the field and beat back the Philistines, so the Lord saved them by giving them a great victory. Once when David was at a rock near the cave of Adjalim, the Philistine army was camped in the valley of Rephim. The three, who were among the thirty, an elite group among David's fighting men, went down to meet him there. David was staying in the stronghold at the time, and a Philistine detachment had occupied the town of Bethlehem. David remarked longingly to his men, Oh, how I would love some of that good water from the well in Bethlehem, the one by the gate. So the three broke through the Philistine lions, drew some water from the well, and brought it back to David. But David refused to drink it, and so he poured it out before the Lord. God forbid that I should drink this, he exclaimed. This water is as precious as the blood of these men who risked their lives to bring it to me. So David did not drink it. This is an example of the exploits of the three. David's 30 mighty men. 
Abishai, the brother of Job, was the leader of the thirty. He once used his spear to kill three hundred enemy warriors in a single battle. It was by such feats that he became as famous as the three. Abishai was the most famous of the thirty and was their commander, though he was not one of the three. There was also Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant warrior from Kabzeel. He did many heroic deeds, which included killing two of Moab's mightiest warriors. Another time he chased a lion down into a pit, then despite the snow and slippery ground he caught the lion and killed it. Another time, armed with only a club, he killed an Egyptian warrior who was seven who was sorry, who was seven and a half feet tall, and whose spear was as thick as a weaver's beam. Benaiah wrecked the spear, wrenched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with it. These are some of the deeds that made Benaiah Benaiah as famous as the three. He was more honored than the other men of the thirty, though he was not one of the three, and David made him commander of his bodyguard. These were also included among David's mighty men. Asahel, Job's brother, Elhanan, son of Dodo from Bethlehem, Shama from Herod, Helez from Pelon, Ira, son of Ikesh from Tekoa, Abizer from Anathoth, Sibakai from Husha, Zalman from Ahoa, Maharai from Nedapha, Helid, son of Bana from Nedapha, Ithai, son of Ribai from Gibeah, from the tribe of Benjamin, Beniah from Pirathon, Hurai from near Gahil Gash, Abi Alban from Arbathite, the Arbathite, Asmaveth from, from Bahurim, Eliaba from Shalban, the sons of Jashin from Gizon, Jonathan, son of Shaggy from Harar, Ahiam, son of Sharar from Harar, Eliphal, son of Ur, Hefer from Mechara, Ahijah from Pelan, Hezro from Carmel, Parai, son of Ezbi, Joel, the brother of Nathan, Mibhar, son of Hagri, Zelik from Ammon, Naharai from Biroth, Job's armor bearer, Ira from Jatir, Gareb from Jatir, Uriah of the Hittite, Zabad, son of Ali, Adina, son of Shiza, the Reubenite leader, who had 30 men with him, Hannah, Hanan, son of Maka, Joshaphat from Mithna, Uzziah from Ashtaroth, Shema and Jael, the sons of Hotham from Aror, Jadiel, son of Shimri, Joha, his brother from Tiz, Eliel from Mahaba, Jerubai and Joshabiah, the sons of Elnam, Ithma from Mob, Eliel and Obed, Jasiel from Zaba, Zoba. Okay, in chapter 12, warriors join David's army. The following men joined David at Ziklag while he was hiding from Saul, son of Kish. They were among the warriors who fought beside David in battle. All of them were expert archers, and they could shoot arrows or sling stones with their, with their left hand as well as their right. They were all relatives of... Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. Their leader was Ahazer, son of Shema from Gibeah. His brother Josh was second in command. These were the other warriors. Jeziel and Pellet, sons of Azmaveth, Berakah and Jehu from Anathoth, Ishmaiah from Gibeah, a famous warrior and leader among the thirty, Jeremiah, Jehaziel, Johanan, and Jozebad from Gedera. Elazai, Jeremoth, Beliah, Shemariah, and Shephatiah from Haraf, Elkanah, Ishiah, Azarel, Jozer, and Jashabim, who were Korahites, Jola, and Zebediah, sons of Jeroham from Gedor. Some brave and experienced warriors from the tribe of Gad also defected to David while he was at the stronghold in the wilderness. They were expert with both shield and spear, as fierce as lions and as swift as deer on the mountains. 
uh, Ezer, Ezer was our leader, Obadiah was second, Eliab was third, Mishmanah was fourth, Jeremiah was fifth, Adai was sixth, Eliel was seventh, Johanan was eighth, Elzabad was ninth, Jeremiah was tenth, Macbani was eleventh. These warriors from Gad were, were army commanders. The weakest among them could take on a hundred regular troops, and the strongest could take on a thousand. They crossed the Jordan River during its seasonal flooding at the beginning of the year and drove out all the people living in the lowlands on both the east and west banks. Others from Benjamin and Judah came to David at the stronghold. David went out to meet them and said, If you have come in peace to help me, we are friends. But if you, if you have come to betray me to my enemies when I am innocent, then may the God of our ancestors see and judge you. And the Spirit came upon Amasai, who later became a leader among the thirty, and he said, we are yours, David. We are on your side, son of Jesse. Peace and prosperity be with you, and success to all who help you. For your God is the one who helps you. So David let them join him, and he made them officers over his troops. Some men from Manasseh defected from the Israelite army and joined David when he went to the Philistines to fight against Saul. But as it turned out, the Philistine leaders refused to let David and his men go with them. After much discussion, they sent them back, for they said, It will cost us our lives if David switches loyalties to Saul and turns against us. Here is a list of the men from Man Manasseh who defected to David as he was returning to Ziklag. Adna, Jazabad, Jediel, Michael, Jazabad, Elihu, and Zilathai. Each commanded a thousand troops from the tribe of Manasseh. They helped David chase down bands of raiders, for they were all brave and able warriors who became commanders in his army. Day after day, more men joined David until he had a great army, like the army of God. These are the numbers of armed warriors who joined David at Hebron. They were all eager to see David become king instead of Saul, just as the Lord had promised. From the tribe of Judah, there were 6,800 warriors armed with shields and spears. From the tribe of Simeon, there were 7,100 warriors. From the tribe of Levi, there were 4,600 troops. This included Jehoiada, leader of the family of Aaron, who had 3,700 under his command. This also included Zadok, a young warrior, with 22 members of his family who were all officers. Wow. From the tribe of Benjamin, Saul's relatives, <coughs> there were 3,000 warriors. Most of the men from Benjamin had remained loyal to Saul until this time. From the tribe of, from the tribe of Ephraim were 20,800 warriors, each famous in his own clan. From the half-tribe of Manasseh, west of the Jordan, 18,000 men were sent for the ex express purpose of helping David become king. From the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives. All these men understood the temper of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. From the tribe of Zebulun, Zebulun there were 50,000 skilled warriors. They were fully armed and prepared for battle and completely loyal to David. In the tribe of Naphtali, there were 1,000 officers and 30, 37,000 warriors armed with shields and spears. From the tribe of Dan, there were 28,600 warriors all prepared for battle. From the tribe of Asher, there were 40,000 trained warriors all prepared for battle. From the east side of the Jordan River, where the tribes of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh lived, there were 120,000 troops armed with every kind of weapon. All these men came in battle array to Hebron and with the single purpose of making David the king of Israel. In fact, all Israel agreed that David should be their king. They feasted and drank with David for three days, for preparations had been made by their relatives for their arrival. And people from as far away as Issachar, Zebulun, and Naphtali brought food on donkeys, camels, mules, and oxen. Vast supplies of flour, fig cakes, raisins, wines, olive oil, cattle, and sheep were brought to the celebration. There was great joy throughout the land of Israel. Okay, and then Job, chapter 16. Okay, Job's fifth speech, a response to Eliphaz. Then Job spoke again. I have heard all this before. What miserable comforters you are. Won't you ever stop your flow of foolish words? What have I said that makes you speak so endlessly? I could say the same things if you were in my place. I could spout off my criticisms, criticisms against you and shake my head at you. But that's not what I would do. I would speak in a way that helps you. I would try to take away your grief. But as it is, my grief remains no matter how I defend myself. And it does not help if I refuse to speak. Oh God, you have ground me down and devastated my family. You reduced me to skin and bones as proof they say of my sins. 
God hates me and tears angrily at my flesh. He gnashes his teeth at me and pierces me with his eyes. People jeer and laugh at me. They slap my cheek in contempt. A mob gathers against me. God has handed me over to sinners. He has tossed me into the hands of the wicked. I was living quietly until he broke me apart. He took me by the neck and dashed me to pieces. Then he set me up as his target. His archers surrounded me and his arrows pierced me without mercy. The ground is wet with my blood. Again and again he smashed me, charging me like a warrior. Here I sit in sackcloth. I have surrendered and I sit in the dust. My eyes are red with weeping. Darkness covers my eyes. Yet I am innocent and my prayer is pure. O earth, do not conceal my blood. Let it cry out on my behalf. Even now my witness is in heaven. My advocate is there on high. My friends scorn me, but I pour out my tears to God. Oh, that someone would meditate. No. Oh, that someone would mediate between God and me as a person mediates between friends. For soon I must go down that road from which I will never return. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Avoiding lawsuits with Christians. When you have something against another Christian, why do you file a lawsuit and ask a secular court to decide the matter, instead of taking it to other Christians to decide who is right? Don't you know that someday we Christians are going to judge the world? And since you're going to judge the world, can't you decide these little things among yourselves? Don't you realize that we Christians will judge angels? So you should surely be able to resolve ordinary disagreements here on earth. If you have legal disputes about such matters, why do you go to outside judges who are not respected by the church? I am saying this to shame you. Isn't there anyone in all the church who is wise enough to decide these arguments? But instead, one Christian sues another right in front of unbelievers. To have such lawsuits at all is a real defeat for you. Why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that? Why not let yourselves be cheated? But instead, you yourselves are the ones who do wrong and cheat even your own Christian brothers and sisters. Avoiding sexual sin. Don't you know that those who do wrong will have no share in the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, who are idol worshippers, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexuals, thieves... Greedy people, drunkards, abusers, and swindlers, none of these will have a share of the kingdom of God. There was a time when some of you were just like that, but now your sins have been washed away and you have been set apart for God. You have been made right with God because of what the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God has done for you. You may say, I am allowed to do anything, but I reply, not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say, food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food. This is true, though someday God will do away with both of them. But our bodies were not made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord and the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise our bodies from the dead by his marvelous power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body which belongs to Christ... And join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you know that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say the two are united into one. But the person who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Run away from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Or don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. That is all for today's reading. I will see you next time.